We're gonna jump back into the book of James. So if you got your Bibles, go ahead and turn to James chapter one. And we're gonna unpack this topic of temptation. That's the part where you go, oh. As we've looked so far, we do know that, that trials are inevitable. As what James started out this book about, was trials are coming, we don't know when they're coming and we don't know what they look like. But all we know is that we're to take joy when they do. Okay, we've already talked about all of that. But we know that God oftentimes, or not oftentimes, all the time, he either allows a trial or he sends a trial to test our faith. And that true test, that ultimate test is when we walk through a trial, and we will, the testing of our faith is the result of are we gonna run to God or are we gonna run away from him? Are we gonna run to him or are we going to run from him? And we heard the heart of the Father, we heard the heart of God is that God allows or sends trials so that we will run to him. Because this is when he proves himself faithful. This is when he shows us of his character and the love that he has for his children. But while trials are inevitable, what we're gonna learn today is also temptation is. What's interesting is trials and temptations, the two of them usually go hand in hand. They usually come together. So trials comes in attempt to pull us close to God, but oftentimes, all the time, temptation comes wanting the opposite response, wanting the opposite results, wanting it to pull us away from him. So trials are allowed to happen or sent to happen so that we will run to God, but we face temptation to pull us away from God. And so the two are very closely connected. But what I'm here to tell you today is that there is a very, very clear difference. And this is why I believe James uses such strong language as what he says in verse 16 of chapter one. Don't be deceived, my brothers and sisters. Don't be deceived. And what he's alluding to, what he's wanting us to understand is that yes, trials may come from God. However, temptation never will come from God. Oftentimes people, because the two are so closely related, they believe, well, if God is gonna send trials, then God must also send temptation. And what we're gonna understand today is that will never be the case. That will never be the case. And James wants us to say there, don't be deceived. Don't think the same loving father that allows or sends trials so that draws you close to him, don't ever think that he's gonna be the one that's gonna tempt you, attempting to lure you away. And so we see that he makes that very clear. Look at what verse 13 says, and I know we're kind of bouncing around, but you'll understand kind of why in just a moment. But verse 13, no one undergoing a trial should say, I am being tempted by God. Since God is not tempted by evil, and he himself doesn't tempt anyone. And so we see there that according to the word of God, if we believe that this is the truth of God's word, at the end of the day, what we just read is all that matters. That God will never be the source of our temptation. And so then we keep on going and we see that While trials and temptations will never go together, it honestly makes sense to even those who who, who use common sense. If trial is meant to draw us close to God, then why would the same God that wants us to draw close to him send something that's gonna push us away? And so we read there that God will never be the source of our temptation, but also at the same time, God wants us close to him. So God is never going to send something that has the potential that will draw us away from him. Those two completely contradict themselves. 
That completely contradicts himself that a loving father would do something that would bring us close to him and at the same time do something that would pull us away from him. And so this is the very thing that James wants us to understand is that God will never be the source of our temptation. And so therefore, we as his children can never say, I am being tempted by God. How many times do we jokingly say things like that? God's really testing me. Yes, he will test our faith through trials, but he's never gonna test us through temptation. It's not who he is. It's not in his character. I found this this week, and it says this, that God is untouched by evil, meaning he has no association with evil. So he cannot and will not tempt us with something that he doesn't possess. So if he doesn't possess anything that's evil, how can he use something evil to lure us away? So he will never test us with something that he doesn't possess. But we also have to be ready and understand that we are all going to face temptation. And so what I wanna do this morning is just spend some time to help us understand and paint a picture of what temptation is and the danger of temptation. And so when we look at this word temptation, here's the simplest definition that I wanna share with you this morning. And I want you to write this down because this is so simple and I believe it makes so much sense to the child of God. Temptation is this. Temptation is an opportunity to choose something other than God. Temptation is an opportunity to choose something other than God. And so as these trials of life come, As we walk through difficult seasons, you understand that in that trial, there is always going to be a choice to be made. There's always going to be a decision that we have to make. Remember, a trial is sent to pull us close to God and a temptation is what causes to pull us away from God. And so what we have to realize is that in face and adversity in this trial, are we going to choose to run to him? Are we gonna choose to run from him? Are we gonna choose to follow the temptation? Or are we gonna choose to turn and run to the father who loves us? And that's exactly what James wants the children of God to know. Read verses 14 and 15 with me. But each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desire, and then after the desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. Now, first and foremost, one thing that we have to make clear, temptation in and of itself is not sin. Do you understand? Temptation in and of itself is not sin. A lot of times, I don't know about you, but I even feel guilty. I even feel dirty when I face temptation. But what I have to understand is that temptation is not sin. Our response to the temptation is what births the sin. And that's exactly what you just read in verse 15. But the two phrases are the words that I really want us to focus on this morning are those two words that help us get a clear picture of how temptation operates and how it works. The first word is drawn away, or some of your Bibles probably say carried away. The definition to this phrase is a fishing term. It is one that talks about being lured away from a hiding place. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more detail in just a moment. So being drawn away or being carried away is being lured away from a hiding place. This word enticed is the result of being drawn away. This is when you're caught by the bait. This is when you've been hooked. This is when you've been deceived. This is when you've been lied to. 
And so if you're familiar with fishing, you're probably already understanding the language of James. You're already understanding what it means to be drawn away, to be lured away. You may know what it means to be hooked. All of those things are for the fishermen. But if you don't understand fishing, I wanna make this as clear as I possibly can. And some of you men, you're probably going, you're too prideful to tell we don't understand fishing and your fishing results show us that. So maybe you can learn something today. We'll give you kind of some fishing tips at the same time. But if you know anything about a fish, a fish knows particular hiding places. Whether it be in a, in a, a, a root ball that comes off of a bank where the waters come up. Maybe the hiding place is under a rock ledge. Maybe the, the hiding place is in a deep crevice of a river. Maybe it's in the, in the safest place that it can possibly find from predators. And so if this is where the fish lies, as if this is where the fish stays, the fisherman's job is to get them out of that hiding place, to get them out of that security. And the way that they do that is that they put the bait on a hook. Now, it's very important that that hook is hidden. That hook needs to be concealed because if the fish sees the hook, the fish has the common sense to know that something doesn't look right about that. And so we bait the hook, we cover the hook with things that look good, things that smell good, things that taste good. And so what then we do is we attempt to get this lure, this covered hook, as close to the hiding place as we possibly can. And that lure, that bait begins to dangle out in front of that fish. The fish is in its security. The fish is in its safe place. The fish is hiding. But then all of a sudden, the fish begins to look out. And in the moment the fish sees something that appeals to his flesh, then all of a sudden the nature of that fish takes over. They see something that they're drawn to. They smell something that entices them. They smell something that lures them out of their safe place. And then all of a sudden the fish lets his nature take over. They leave their security. They leave their safe place. And before they realize it, they're hooked. They're hooked, which ultimately leads either to the frying pan or their death. Now, some of you are going, well, I'm catching release. Well, good for you. I'm not. <laughs> if I catch it, I'm going to eat it. But at the end of the day, this is exactly how trials and temptations go together. Because as a child of God, all of us would say this morning, that the presence of God is our safety, that the presence of God is our strength, that the presence of God is our security, that our intimacy with God, this is our safe place. This is our refuge. But oftentimes, no matter how well we know this, when a trial comes, when difficult seasons come in life, we begin to question we begin to question, is God our refuge? Is God our safe place? Because maybe if he was, this wouldn't be so tough. And then all of a sudden, what begins to happen is that even in our hiding place, we begin to look out. And we begin to find safety. We begin to look for safety. We begin to look for peace in places other than the presence of God. And can I go ahead and tell you right now, if you ever look elsewhere for safety, for peace, for comfort, for all of those things, you will find it temporarily. I want you to understand that. You will find it temporarily. So as you're in the safe place, as you're in the presence of God, you know he's your safety, you know he's your security. You have to also be aware, if you ever look elsewhere, you're gonna find what your flesh is looking for. And as you find what your flesh is looking for, you're gonna be lured out of the security and the safety and the presence of God 
You're gonna leave his presence. You're gonna leave the security that you have in him and you're gonna be lured away and before you know it, you're hooked. Before you know it, you're enticed. Now listen to me. This is the constant war that wages in the heart of a child of God. This is the constant battle. Is which one are we gonna choose? Now, I want you to hear me, and I want you to hear me loud and clear. When you're lured away from the safe place, when you're lured away from the security, hear me when I say this. It doesn't mean you're not saved. It doesn't mean you lose your salvation. But it means that you're choosing to follow the old nature instead of resting in the new nature that you have in Jesus Christ. That he's your security. That he's your safe place. One pastor said this, that temptation is always rooted in the lie that something other than God can meet my need and satisfy the desire of my heart. Temptation is always rooted in the lie that something's better than God. And so if the enemy can lure us, if the enemy can get us to leave the security and the presence of God before we realize it, we're hooked. Before we realize that we've been drawn away. But praise be unto God, we never leave the grip of God. We never leave the hand of God. And so the believer, listen to me. At salvation, according to the scripture, we're given a new nature. At salvation, we are given a new nature. But we will constantly, until our life here is over, we will always battle with the tendency to go back, to revert back to the old nature. I wanna read this to you. This is from a commentary that I was studying this week. It says, the believer has the capacity for godliness because the spirit of God lives within them. He still has the capacity to sin as well but he now has the ability to resist sin and more importantly, the desire to resist and to live godly. And so when we wrestle with temptation and at times when we fall back into the temptation, when we take the bait, when we're lured away, what we have to resolve in our heart is this is gonna be something that we wrestle with until the day our life here is over or Jesus Christ comes back. This is gonna be a constant battle. Paul, who wrote the majority of the New Testament, he acknowledges this struggle. He acknowledges this battle. In Romans chapter seven, he's sorrowful for this battle. And to paraphrase it, Paul even says, he says that he does the things that he doesn't want to do. I do the things that I don't wanna do. And I do evil things, even the things I detest. I still do them. That's Paul. So if Paul wrestles with it, who are we to think we shouldn't? And are we still gonna do things that we detest? Yes. Are we still gonna do things that this new nature inside of us knows that we're not supposed to be doing? Yes. We're still gonna battle. We're still gonna face these temptations. And in most cases, when we face the temptations is when we're walking through a trial. It's because remember, temptation is always rooted in the lie that something other than God can give us what we're looking for. But you know, the beauty and the power of God as we face trials, this new nature that now lives inside of us is the very nature that allows us to also Resist the temptation. If you've got your Bible, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Verses 12 and 13. Paul's writing to the church at Corinth about this very thing. 
He says, so whoever thinks he stands must be careful not to fall. What he's meaning there is don't ever think that you can conquer temptation in your own power. Don't ever think that you can overcome temptation in your own strength. Verse 13, no temptation has come upon you except what is common to humanity. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able But with the temptation, listen, he will also provide the way out so that you may be able to bear it. So not only is the presence of God, this new nature that lives inside of us, not only is it our strength to overcome temptation, but what we also know is that the loving father that we serve, the loving God that we follow, that we trust, he will always give us an out. He will always give you an out to escape or flee the temptation. So always make yourself aware that always the strength is inside of us. But maybe there's gonna be times of weakness when we forget that that strength comes from him and him alone. If we don't rely on that strength, God will also always give you a way out. He will always give you an exit plan. He will always give you a way out, away from this temptation. And I believe that that's what verse, 13, or verse 17 of chapter one of James is talking about. Verse 17, every good and perfect gift is from above. The fact that God always gives us a way out is the good gift from the Father. Is a good gift that he gives his children Not only is this gift salvation, which ultimately allows us to conquer death, hell, and the grave for eternity, what we also know is that this good gift from God, this strength that lies within us, this escape plan that he gives us, it gives us the ability to overcome sin here on this earth. And I don't know about you, but that is encouraging news because I know me and I don't have the ability in my flesh to overcome my temptation. I have to be dependent on God. I have to be dependent upon what he has placed inside of me. And so maybe this morning, we've established that temptation doesn't come from God. We've established that he will give us the strength to overcome it. He'll give us the way out. But maybe there's that looming question in your mind today of, well, if temptation doesn't come from God, where does it come from? And this is probably a question that we all want answered. And the reason that we all want this question answered is because we've all got to put blame somewhere, right? That's human nature. That if I keep falling into temptation, if I keep giving in and this temptation gives birth to sin, then it's got to be somebody else's fault. It's got to be some individual's fault. It's got to be the devil's fault. Because our human nature is we don't like to take responsibility. We don't like to take responsibility when we make mistakes. And our human nature is to not, is to kind of shun that responsibility and point fingers elsewhere. And so maybe you're already sitting here going, yep, that's what I do. How many times have you blamed your sin on your spouse? Right? You're mad, you're angry. You've sinned in your anger. It's gotta be their fault. They're the one that pushed you over the edge, right? It's gotta be on them. And as I was studying and reading this, I began to beat myself up because I was like, man, I always put blame on somebody else. When I yell at that person that just cut me off, that's their fault. If they hadn't cut me off, I wouldn't be angry. So before you beat yourself up too bad, I want you to understand that this blame game that you get so mad at your children for doing all the time, this is something that began at the creation of man. This blame game. And to paraphrase it, you all know that in the garden, that God instructed Adam, don't eat of that tree. And then we all know how that story transpired. 
We know that him and his wife both took a bite of the fruit. God comes to Adam in the garden and he says, did you do what I said not to do? And Adam's response was this. The woman you gave me, gave it to me. (laughs) Not only does he blame the woman, but he ultimately blames God. He says, God, if you would have never given me this woman, I would have never given in to temptation. So God, you gave me this woman and she's the one that caused me to fall. Then he goes on to Eve and he says, what have you done? And y'all know her response, the devil made me do it. (laughs) So here you have Adam and Eve in the garden at the beginning of mankind. And what are they already doing? We're blaming our spouse, we're blaming God, and we're blaming the devil. All as a result of their mistake. All as a result of them giving in to temptation. And so we know how the story played out. Adam and Eve were both carried away and enticed, which ultimately led to death. And so in that moment, this sin nature was conceived in all of mankind. This sin nature was conceived in every man, woman, boy, and girl. And the harsh reality as a result of their sin, their sin nature has been passed down for years and years. So I guess if we're gonna blame anybody, we can blame Adam and Eve, right? It's their fault. But that's not the point. So where does this temptation come from? We kind of skipped over it just a moment ago, but if you read it just a moment ago, they were carried away and enticed by what? Their own evil desires. They were carried away and enticed by their own evil desire. The very thing, the very reason where this temptation comes from, it comes from deep within our heart because it's the human nature that we're born with. And this is the very reason that God sent his only son to die, was to give us the new nature because this old sin nature is the very thing that separates us from a loving father. But God in his love for us wanted to reconcile us back to him. So he sent his son to give us this new nature, to give us this new spirit. But at the end of the day, when we're drawn away and when we're enticed by the desires of our flesh, listen to me, the only one we have to blame is ourselves. And I know that's a harsh reality. I know we don't like to hear that because it's a whole lot easier to say the devil made me do it. What's interesting is in James chapter one and all this conversation about temptation, do you realize that James doesn't even mention the devil? He doesn't even mention Satan. He doesn't even mention the deceiver. But what we have to understand is, look, I'm not saying that Satan doesn't have anything to do with baiting us, with enticing us, with carrying us away because I believe he's very well capable of knowing when we're weak. But at the same time, what we have to understand is that the first step in escaping our temptation and our sin is to take responsibility. We've got to take responsibility that when we give into temptation, it's because we're giving into our own evil desires. You know, again, Paul talks about in Romans chapter seven, he says that apart from Christ, there's nothing good in me. So the first step in overcoming our temptation is to acknowledge there's nothing good in us. There's nothing good in us to be able to please God. 
to be able to please this wrath of God. But by placing our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ, in that moment of salvation is when we're given everything we need to be able to overcome temptation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says that. Then if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All the old things, they're gone. And all the new things have come. The new things is that new nature, that new awareness that we have to temptation, that new awareness that we have to sin. And so what we have to understand first and foremost this morning is that the same God that will allow trials in our life to bring us close to him will never send temptation to pull you away. He'll never send something to pull you away from him. But the question is, is if we acknowledge that God is our security, that if we acknowledge that God is our safety and our safe place, when we walk through the trials of life, are we gonna press into that truth? Are we gonna trust this security? Are we gonna trust the hope that we have in Christ Jesus? Or are we begin again to look elsewhere? Because as I told you earlier, if you look elsewhere, you will find it temporarily. You will find it, but before you realize it, you'll be hooked, which ultimately will lead to disaster and destruction. And so this morning, you know, maybe you're here today and this relationship with God is a foreign concept to you. Because somewhere along the line, you've been taught you have to be good enough to please God. What I want you to know this morning is the truth of God's word is that the only thing that can please God is what he's already done to his son and allowed to happen to his son. That his son gave his life for you. And by you placing your faith and trust in the finished work, this is how you're declared righteous. Not by your works, but by the work that's already been accomplished. And maybe today you continue to give in to your own evil desires. And you say, well, I've got I've to beat this before God will love me. I've got to beat the temptation. I've got to beat the addiction. I've got to beat the habit before God will be pleased with me. No, you don't. All you have to do is place your faith in the finished work of what Jesus has done. And this is what allows God to be pleased with you. And now all of a sudden, when you place your faith there, the spirit of God is given inside you to give you the ability to overcome the temptation that used to keep you in chains that used to own you. And so today, if you've never placed your faith in him, don't leave here today without surrendering to that. But maybe as a child of God, as a result of a trial or a difficult season in life, maybe you've been lured away from the presence of God. Maybe you've been lured away from what you know is your security, what you know is your safe place. And even as a child of God today, you feel unworthy because here's what's happened. The very chain that has been broken, the bondage of the sin that you've been set free from, as a result of this trial, you've picked that chain back up. You've picked that addiction back up. You've picked that struggle back up. But here's the beauty of it. Notice I didn't say that you've been connected back with it. That it has been reconnected because it's not. You've made a choice to pick it up. And I pray today that the Spirit of God is just encouraging you just to let go of it. Let go of the chain that's already been broken. Just let go of it. 
But there's no doubt in my mind that there's a child of God here who has been lured away, carried away, and you've been enticed going back to your old nature. And I'm here today to encourage you that that is the very thing that you've already been set free from. So as the enemy is telling you today you're worthless, you point to the cross and say, my worth has already been paid for. My worth has already been nailed to the cross. And I serve a God today that if I'm willing to drop my chain and I'm willing to let go, my father's gonna hold me. And so today I pray for the child of God who has picked the chain back up to be reminded that he is your strength to overcome, that he is your power, and he will always provide a way out. I remember an analogy that I saw years ago, Louis Giglio, at 722 when I was in college. He talked about this very passage and how God would always provide a way out. And as we got to the church that night, we looked and there was doors all over the stage. And the first door was a double door, just like you're gonna leave in just a moment. And he said, in the moment of that temptation, he said, the door is easy to escape. It's as easy as walking out a double door. And that's that first look. God's provided the way and if you flee, you're in the security and the presence of God. But if you look back for that second look, now all of a sudden it's no longer a double door, it's a single door. Yeah, you can still exit pretty easily. But then when it's that third look, now all of a sudden, y'all, and this is my cheesy mind, I'm gonna age myself. Y'all remember Mr. Ed, the horse? Y'all know the door that the door would sling open and it was cut in half? Now all of a sudden, when you take that third look, that door's cut in half. You can still escape, but there's a lot more effort that has to be put forth. And the closer and the further that you're drawn away from the presence of God, from the security and the safety of God, the size of that door continues to shrink and shrink and shrink until all of a sudden it's at like a quarter size of what it began. And now you've got to put forth a lot of effort to get out. However, the beauty of the gospel is that there's still a way out. But you've made a choice to get too close. You've made a choice to keep flirting with it. But today as a child of God, if I could ever encourage you to do anything, when you see the double door, you run. You run. And so as a child of God today, if you face temptation, be reminded that the power of the Holy Spirit lives inside of you to give you the ability to overcome. But you've got to rest in his safety. You've got to rest in him as your security. But today, maybe you don't have a relationship with the Lord. I pray that today, before you leave, you run to that safe place.